It's episode 157 of the Security Weekly News. Welcome to the week of 10 October 2021, remote. Uh, Apple, SnapMC, the NSA, Olympus, Brother, Android, Facebook, and Hookers on Fire. All this and Jason Wood on the Security Weekly News. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Every 11 seconds, there's a new ransomware attack. Oil pipelines, universities, corporations, all paying millions of dollars. Barracuda says... Don't pay the ransom. Before a ransomware attack occurs, train your teams to recognize an attack and use anti-phishing technology. Protect your applications and they can't get onto your network. Simple backup and restore solutions quickly recover your data without paying the ransom. Build your ransomware protection plan now by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. All right, welcome back to the Security Weekly News. I, I was looking at this, I was like, did I use the wrong notes? Because Apple patched another zero day. <laughs> I was like, wait, was the, we already did this story, right? And I was like, no, oh, this is a new one. Uh, so now they're going to version 15.0.2 on iOS. Wow. Now, Apple doesn't announce updates for vulnerabilities. I mean, we all know that. And uh, they say that basically this gives an invite to people to exploit so they just announce it when the patch is released. So that that's a, that's a you know that's one approach, and I mean you can kind of see some logic to that. Although it means you may be being exploited and not know it. Uh, this particular one now says that, and, and this is the quote from Apple: "An application may be able to execute arbitrary code with kernel privileges." Very deadpan. And Apple is aware of a report that this issue may have been actively exploited. And then it goes on to describe it as a memory corruption issue and was addressed with improved memory handling. I mean, nobody's ever, ever going to accuse Apple of not being deadpan. I mean, very British. It's like, I'm sorry, ma'am, your husband was chopped into tiny pieces, which were then used to make sausages. Have a nice cup of tea. You know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, very, you know, stiff upper lip kind of thing from Apple. Anyway, apps in iOS, if you don't know a lot about how iOS works, all the apps run as if they were users, essentially. So each app is essentially set up as an individual user. And that has the effect of, of, of insulating them from each other so that if they do something wacky, they really only have access to their own space. But this particular exploit, which isn't really explained, so I don't have a lot of information here about exactly what this exploit did or does, um, but it says it basically allows the app to execute remote code as the kernel. And not that kernel, but like the K-E, yeah, and not like, I tell you, boys, I would say, no, not that kernel, but but yeah, the, the kernel kernel. And and I would you know you if, if that that's bad yeah so I'll be like Apple if that would be bad yeah um, but anyway so despite the memo you know it, it does look pretty grim uh, but anyway have a nice cup of tea and upgrade to fifteen point zero point two and um, Apple's been having a lot of bad days lately I mean it's like every week you know we've been up, done a new version Snap MC is a new actor that just they that, got my attention because I I don't know I read the headline and I was like wait what and. <laughs> Uh, basically, uh, it, it was sort of like, this is a, a new approach to ransomware, is ransomware without encryption. I was like, uh, okay, I, I mean, isn't that just exfiltration? Like, people have been doing that for years. But anyway, this is a, 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 a new approach, apparently, and it involves ransomware that just steals the files, so it takes takes your stuff, and it doesn't bother to encrypt the stuff locally. Um and then, you know, they try to ransom the files back to you. So SnapMC uses the uh, Acunetics vulnerability scanner, and they find flaws in VPNs and web servers, and then they breach the network space using those common vectors. Uh, once that's done, they grab all the data, and then they ransom it. So I guess it is ransomware. It's just ransomware that doesn't actually encrypt anything, because we've come to associate ransomware with localized encryption. Um, 
I think the moral is that that people have learned to have backups and have them out of band and 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 protect against those. So basically, the encryption isn't much of a threat anymore, and the threat of data release is a more effective way to get the ransom paid. So yeah, I mean, I guess that that makes it kind of new. And so I, I was just kind of like, wait, what? Why is this new? But uh, all of the stuff that uh, that SnapMC is doing uses patched vulnerabilities, but you know how that goes. Uh, so it would appear you you have all fixed your backups so that the encryption doesn't really help uh, the ransomware people, but you haven't fixed your patching programs yet. So you know, so please fix your patching programs. I, I mean, you know, and then of course the article goes on to say paying them anyway is risky because they may well release your files even if you pay because they always have that really convenient excuse like we know you paid and we gave you your files back, but unfortunately we got hacked. Yeah, I mean that's that's what they always say. Uh, we were talking last time about medical tech uh, on Friday. I was kind of talking about that and how scary it is that, that a lot of these devices are being targeted and how as we move closer to the mesh of everything, talking to everything else, we, we really get into a lot of a lot of dangerous territory. Uh, over the weekend, Olympus, which is one of the larger medical tech companies, uh, they had to take down all their IT systems in the, in the U.S., Canada and Latin America. Um, they didn't really reveal uh, what happened. They did say they had incident responders and forensicators on the case. They didn't actually say forensicators, but I like that word so much. Thanks, Rob Lee. Um, but, uh, Olymp uh, you know, they, they were down, and so they had to pull everything offline. Olympus was hit really hard by ransomware back in September, which took out all their operations in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. So, so they pretty much, you know, circumnavigated the globe. I'm just wondering if this is a similar attack. Uh, the one in Europe was Black Matter. Um, but, uh, you know, they've had a bad couple of months. So this is just a kind of scary thing. The NSA is warning that, and, and I, I found this a very interesting thing. Uh, initially, I was kind of like, what? But then I, I read it and I actually learned something. So maybe you will too, or maybe you already know all this. The NSA was warning that you shouldn't use broadly scoped certificates uh, due to what is called an alpaca technique. Now, I, I'll be honest, I had not heard this and I immediately went and looked it up. It was a new one on me. Uh, once I read about it, I'd heard about it, but I'd not heard it called an alpaca technique. I don't know why, but when I went and looked it up, I was like, oh, I know. Um, basically what this means, and it's something we all do, uh, is the use of wildcard certificates that are used to manage multiple servers. So people will just put these certificates that have identities like star on them, and then they can use that same certificate on a lot of different servers or even different domains that are all covered under that uh, that uh, wildcard certificate. And so basically what ALPACA stands for is the, the hard to say, application layer protocols for allowing cross protocol attacks. She sells seashells by the seashore. I'm a sheet slitter, I slit sheets, all that stuff. Yeah, um, so it was, it was kind of like, you know, I want a cool acronym that has a cool image that's sort of pre-built, but you know, I'm gonna go ahead and make up words that fit the, <laughs> fit the acronym uh, instead of the other way around. Uh, but it's kind of hard to say. Uh, anyway, how this all works is then um, if you have TLS servers, so this this common sort of the encryption protocol, if you have TLS servers which are running different protocols uh, but are sharing certificates, so they have these global certificates being you know put in place, uh, they can be exploited using a content confusion attack uh, in, at the application layer. So this is this is a thing. Uh, basically what, what all that means then is content confusion is where because you have a shared certificate, it may be possible to redirect traffic to other subdomains that are connected to that wildcard certificate. Uh, and what it, it does, it creates a valid TLS session, which means that it may be possible to get through uh, certain types of firewalling and other, and, and as well as connecting to different types of servers using that same uh, certificate information. Uh, because of this content confusion attack, and I'm, I, it is it is more involved than that, but I ju just wanted to give you sort of a rough outline of it. Um, you know, basically something's supposed to be going to server A, so you set it up on server A, then you put redirects in the stream to server B, and you may be able to to do that because it looks like the TLS session is valid. Uh, the NSA said that Alpaca. Uh, it is a good name. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to lie. And it's got a cool, you know, cute image of an alpaca. But uh, the NSA said that it is, that alpaca is a complex class of exploitation technique that can take many forms, 
and that the attack would require the following, a target web application that uses TLS, another service or app that presents a valid TLS cert with a subject name that would be also valid for the targeted web app. So that's that wild carding stuff. Um, you know, a, a means to redirect network traffic to the second service with something like DNS poisoning or a man in the middle and an HTTP request that is accepted by the second server service that results in at least part of the request being reflected back to the sender. And that all sounds pretty, you know, every time you add a step, any kind of vulnerability starts to sound more and more complicated. So it sounds pretty tough to put together to me right there. But remember, I mean, there's nation states out there that are working on this stuff. And there's also 12 year old kids named Bert who didn't make the esports team last year because his sister put gum in the PS4 controller. So, you know, I mean, I, people do spend the time to do these things and they do spend the time to, to contrive these scenarios. So basically, if you could put all this together, it would allow you to steal session cookies, user data, maybe run arbitrary code on the server even. So, you know, all those sort of fun things that we see coming out of these kind of attacks. So even though it's a bit difficult, I, you know, don't neglect uh, don't neglect these notifications and at least can put them in your consideration uh, file to say, do are we vulnerable to this and are we using wildcard search? Because if you are and you may well be, that may be something you want to correct uh, right away. Uh, Brother, which is a large maker of printers, if you are unfamiliar, it's, you know, I, I, every every office or every place I've ever been has you know brothers like the Xerox of the modern age. But Brother warned that many of their printers may stop working. And I and I, I, I this is what the headline said, and I'm going to qualify that in a minute. If connected to the new Windows 11 with a USB cable. Now, I did realize after I read the story that they may, when they say stop working, it doesn't mean, you know, smoke comes out of them and they never work again. It just means they won't print. Or maybe they will. So listen. Uh, they listed 92 models that were definitely affected by the operating system, not allowing them to print. So there were some of these security rules and things in Windows 11 that seemed to be blocking printing with, through, to a USB device. And another 106 models, uh, it's hard to believe they, ha they have 198 different models of printers, but I guess they do. Uh, and those just displayed an error stating that you could not print to the USB printer. But they went on to say that it would print if you just clicked OK. So it says can't print, you click OK, and, and then it prints. So yeah, <laughs> one of those kind of fun things. Uh, so help desk, uh, incoming alert. Um, but anyway, it, they did say that it would be advisable for the short run to use Ethernet or Wi-Fi connections, which may be challenging. Although, you know, mo I mean, do, do, do a lot of people still use USB printers? I, I mean, I, I wasn't sure about that. All mine are, are either Wi-Fi or I usually hardwire them if I can. I mean, if you have to put one someplace strange, you might use Wi-Fi, but I don't like to do that. I usually put, put them with Ethernet. Um, they did also say in this article that a large number of the printing tools in Windows 11 uh, would not currently work with any of their printers. Uh, according to the article, Windows is already investigating eight other serious issues with Win 11, including one with VirtualBox not working. So as, as ever, I usually hold off on upgrading operating systems until they work some of the basic bugs out. I mean, I just always had this kind of like six month plan. I've never seen an operating system come out that I just had to have absolutely. And if I do, I just put it in a virtual machine and play around with it, which I usually do do. But as far as updating any of my systems, I'm never going to jump on that bandwagon. I'm just not an early adopter. I do the same thing with video games or anything else. I'm like, wait a year and, you know, they'll have all the bugs worked out and it'll be on sale. So, you know. Uh, there are a some number of Android apps in the official Google Play Store now that may not do what they say they do. Uh, the one they were talking about in this particular article is Blender Photo Editor Easy Photo Background Editor. Whoa, talk about hard things to say. Blender Photo Easy Photo Background Editor. Yeah, I, I don't think you can pronounce that. B P E E B B P B P B B P B. If you want to make an acronym out of it, so it could, you know, pick uh, it's llama. Um, anyway, it's one of those apps that is uh, that primarily has Facebook single sign-on capability. So this was one of the features of these apps, 
And so you you download this, a photo editor. People do this all the time, right? Because you're sitting at an airport and you say, oh, I'd like to Photoshop this so I look like I've lost some weight or, or whatever it is. Or this is a background editor, so I just want to blur my background. So here's an easy one. It's got three stars. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. It's got Facebook single sign-on. The problem with this is that the app contains a Trojan and um, that was found. And apparently it's still available as of this morning. It was still in the Google Play Store, according to this article. Tatiana Shiskova the at Kaspersky found this Trojan uh, this week. So this is a, a brand new one. Another security researcher, Maxime Ingrau at Avena said that the other photo editor apps uh, also may contain this Trojan code on the Google Play Store that they found a whole bunch of them. Um, the app in particular, the, this uh, source code that they found requires you to sign in via Facebook. So it doesn't have another option. You can't just log into it. You have to use your Facebook single sign on. And then uh, it uses the JavaScript to collect your credentials. Then it uses the Facebook Graph API to look into your account and see if there are ad campaigns that in particular you have stored payment information. It doesn't appear that it, they didn't say anything about it actually stealing this information per se to be like used illicitly. It looks like they're trying to see what ad campaigns you have, have actually put a credit card with, meaning you, you bought something or you, you're contributing to something. Um, so it may be something along those, you know, those lines of those political stuff or whatever. Uh, other ones that were there, Magic Photo Lab, Pix Photo Motion, Edit 2021, were both identified as having this same Trojan in them. And they have been deleted from the place where you may have downloaded this or some of your people may have downloaded it. Uh, Pix in and of itself had over 500,000 downloads when it was taken down. Uh, the article actually has a full analysis of how the, of the code and how it was analyzed and so forth. So if you're interested in such things or you want to get more information about how to get rid of that or how to detect it. Speaking of Facebook, uh, Facebook's been in a lot of news cycles this last week or so. And, uh, and the latest one is Francis Hagen, Hagen, I don't know how you say that, uh, trying to explain Facebook to a bunch of 80-year-olds in the U.S. Uh, Congress. Um, Hagen, I'm going to say Hagen, 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 Hagen. Anyway, um, the, the person whose name I can't say, I should have looked that up, is a former, and I should have heard it, right, but I just read all the stories. I didn't actually listen to them. Um, is a former Facebook employee who decided to blow the whistle on an algorithm. So, and that's the algorithm in, you know, capital letters, the algorithm. And the algorithm uh, decides what you see and how it affects everyone in a negative way. So she, they, I'll use the right pronoun. They became concerned that, um, that this, the algorithm was doing bad things to people, you know, kind of like we've seen. It's kind of like in that dystopian book, uh, the circle, right? They were talking about that. And then, and then there's a couple of episodes of black mirror about stuff like that. But according to, to, uh, Hogan, the algorithm uses more than 10,000 different factors to decide what you're going to see on your newsfeed and what kind of friend recommendations you get and so forth. And, and they went on to claim that it is a huge threat to our society uh, because according to the testimony, the algorithm is optimized to get a reaction. And guess what? One of the easiest ways to get reactions from people and to get them to interact more is to piss them off. Yeah, push that old button, baby, and they're gonna dive right in. Like, how dare you? You know, I mean, I, uh, you kids today and your Confederate flags, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, look at the reaction people got from that OK symbol stuff. You know, I mean, I mean, it was amazing how much uh, you know, all kind of threats and things went on about all that. Uh, and I'm, I'm not getting in. I'm not touching any of that stuff. But uh, according to that, the algorithm basically learned that anger gets more posts. Imagine that. Um, anger or cat pictures. But remember, you remember all those bots that they had a few years ago that turned racist? You know, I don't know who was it, except for the IBM or somebody, or maybe it was, it was Microsoft. They had to turn them off because they set up some chat bots and they got real racist real fast. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, apparently, the government. Uh, is now interested in trying to rein in Facebook or at least learn how to use this algorithm for their own re-election campaigns, uh, because not that they would ever do anything like this. Uh, if, Of course, they would have to first start by figuring out what an algorithm actually is. Some of them apparently didn't quite understand the term. Um, or, or, you know, how can you run it on a flip phone or something like that? 
Um, five different bills have been introduced this year that focus on uh, this sort of thing in the EU, the UK, and China, and they're all taking various actions. I think the best comment I saw was from Malinowski who, from New Jersey, who said, it's not that there's bad stuff on the internet. It said that these social networks are actively working to spread this bad stuff as fast as possible. Um, I might have paraphrased that a little bit, but that's basically what he said. H H Hogan went on to say that Facebook's internet or Facebook's uh, intent was not to push this, but rather they wanted to push users to interact more with each other. But by tying performance bonuses and other encouragement had meant that the side effects of the algorithm were covered up because people were getting, you know, their bonus and performance and stuff evaluated based on how good the algorithm worked. It's tough to find any sort of law that wouldn't violate free speech in the in the West. China can just say Facebook is a bad thing, don't use it. And pretty much everyone will stop using it. Uh, really, they, they really do that. And, and that, that's how they got everyone to quit spitting and smoking. Uh, you know, it was like, whoop, it was just no more smoking. If you can quit smoking, you can quit Facebook. And the U.S., it's a lot more complicated. But most of the bills center around trying to eliminate shielding of social media from liability lawsuits. So guess how many lawyers there were writing these bills. But it's not clear if that would actually help. Different parties, of course, all want the other side declared false misinformation and be allowed to sue them because they said my opponent is an idiot. And all. it's just one big lawsuit. Fest. I don't know the answer. I, and I don't know why all these quotes from Mussolini keep popping up on my feed. But, you know, who knows? Uh, anyway, well... He found a way to recycle old Ethernet cables into sex toys, which made him the king of the Cat 3 sex toy revival. His Cat oh, cat 3 tails and plenum rated underwear is considered de rigueur by consenting adults everywhere. He's none other than Jason Wood. Hey, everybody. It is good to be back with you again. Um, I'll take a little week off We're there for some vacation time and i just missed doug's introductions i just don't know what to make of that um so this story actually kind of is, is following along with what doug was talking a little bit which is regulation um i hesitated to bring it up because it actually kind of focus, starts off focusing on ransomware uh but in the end i found another story that is, you know the one I'm focusing on is here in the U.S. at first, but then we'll talk about one in the U.K. as well, and it just kind of played on that theme. So I guess we're, you know regulation is it for the day. Um, if you know, anybody who's listened to the podcast is, it knows that ransomware is, is a big deal, criminal activity is all over the place, and has been making the news. And guess what? Our politicians have noticed, and they want to get involved in this and 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 save us uh, from the bad guys everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't, like I said, politicians get involved regardless of what country you're in here in the United States, uh, Senator Warren and representative Ross of, in the U S Congress have introduced a new bill, uh, for consideration. And as they hope, uh, passage into law. Now the bill or the act, I guess, as they call it in the, in it is, uh, only five pages long. So you can actually like read this one and understand what the heck they're talking about. Um, so that you know makes looking at this relatively easy. Basically, what the bill is saying is, hey, we've got this problem with ransomware occurring and stuff like that, and we don't we're missing information to fight this. So we've got an idea on how to fight ransomware attacks, uh, and that is basically all victims of ransomware attacks who actually pay in ransom must report if this is passed to the Department of Homeland Security that they've paid a ransom and um, this and their, their view will uh, provide information that we are lacking that w is necessary to fight the, 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 these criminal operations. Now, what are they demanding that the victims or as they like to call them covered entities, um, what do us, do they need to respond and, and provide to DHS? So basically they need to provide the date that the ransom was demanded when the de ransom was paid. Um, how much was demanded originally and how much actually got paid because you know you negotiate that down and the currency used to pay it, especially if there was any cryptocurrency involved in this, whether the victim receives any federal funds, I assume from any source, they don't really specify what that means. Um, and finally, the uh, victim must provide to DHS any information that they know about the actor at least, I guess, at the time of reporting. I don't know if they need to go back later and update the information if they find out more. Uh, that doesn't say, 
I guess a lawyer would argue they don't because they, we reported that at the time that we knew all of this stuff. And it has to be reported within 48 hours of the ransom actually being paid. Now, I looked at this and I thought, okay, so what are the penalties for not not providing this information? Uh, the penalties are to be determined, basically, by the Secretary of Department of Homeland Security. So uh, Congress passes the law and somebody decides how big the club is that we get to get hit with, I guess, if we don't, if the company doesn't pay the ransom, um, or excuse me, pays the ransom and doesn't report it to, to, the, to the government. Now, there's some demands being made of Department of Homeland Security here as well. Uh, basically, they have to put online an annual report uh, af- you know, st- some period of time uh, after the bill goes into effect. If it goes into effect, they have to provide an annual report every year on ransomware activity and you know how much ransoms are being paid out, how much the U.S. is losing uh, to these actors, and... Uh, Identifying information is supposed to be removed from the report. Um, Department of Homeland Security is also required to, within 60 days of enactment of the bill, to provide a website for individuals to voluntarily report that, hey, I've paid a ransom for something. So it is important to note that you know what's covered here is uh, organizations, as they put it, that are involved in interstate commerce or somehow do something that affects interstate commerce, which is a wide catch-all in the U.S. for meaning pretty much everybody. Um, you know, or these the, it has to be businesses though, are, are covered underneath this, and as they're calling it in the bill, covered entities. Uh, as I tend to look at it, they're victims of ransomware attacks. Anyhow, individuals don't have to do this reporting. However, DHS is required to create a website so that victims can report on it if they decide to. And finally. Uh, Department of Homeland Security has 15 months after the bill is made into law to provide a report to Congress on ransomware activity and provide recommendations to Congress on how victims can protect themselves, which I'm expecting to be something like, um, you know, well, you know, use multi-factor authentication and don't click on links and, you know, whatever it is. Nothing in this information is really going to provide anything about you know, the ransomware attacks themselves per se, um, you know, that would be reported in. So we'll see what that looks like if, if this ever gets passed. Um, also, I'll be honest, you probably are picking this up through my tone already. I'm really not interested in this bill, not particularly happy with it, what it's doing. And um, primarily because according to, you know, is what are we accomplishing here? According to Senator Warren and Representative Ross, uh, this is information is needed to go after threat actors who demand ransoms from their victims. Um, maybe, I don't know how that's going to really work. Most of these ransomware operators are occurring overseas, so good luck. Uh, but, you know, Secret Service investigates the, some of this stuff, and they're part of Department of Homeland Security, so maybe it feeds into that. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I really just, the tone of it feels like, you know, hey, you're a victim of this other th- crime over here. Uh, so if you don't do what we want, you're now uh, a new, you're a criminal yourself, and and here are the penalties for, for not complying with this. I just don't like that tone. Uh, that's just kind of my bias, if you will, in, in general. Um, one of the things I also really don't like is a statement in the bill or line in here is the, the, the report from DHS to Congress. And this is a quote that it must detail the extent to which cryptocurrency has facilitated, end quote, ransomware attacks. Uh, the reason why I kind of catch on this is because Senator Warren is a big uh, opponent of cryptocurrency in general. She does not like this at all uh, and has made no secret of her dislike for it. Uh, so I suspect this information will be certainly used to, to turn around and say, see, cryptocurrency is only for illegal, terrible, awful things, and we need to ban all of this and prevent it from being uh, in use and whatnot so that uh, we can stamp out criminals. Uh, now, your opinion of all this, of course, may be very different than mine, and, and that's fine. We all have our different opinions. Like I said, I tend to be very wary of how Congress steps in in, in a lot of this stuff uh, to help us by making more demands on us. Now, unless you think that I'm just focusing on the United States, regulations are coming in the in the UK as well. Uh, probably no surprise to anybody who lives in the UK. Um, 
In this case, uh, this is from the register. I've got the link to this also in the show notes. Lindy Cameron, the CEO of the National Cyber Security Center, has signaled her goals for greater regulations in a speech to uh, a think tank named Chatham House. Uh, the NS, uh, NCSE will be basically launching a new strategy, uh, as they, as she put it, to scale the impact, in quotes, um, that the center delivers on UK cybersecurity. And this is going to focus on supply chain review, targeting of particular managed security providers and their security practices. And it sounds like this is going to be very involved. She makes a comment. We don't want to have just a checklist here. We want to get down and examine the practices, the engineering practices of the developer, in quotes again, uh, and how proportional their security practices are to the work they're doing, developing whatever the app is and, and whatever the goal is of that. So they want to get right down into the weeds of how, how that's being used. Uh, Cameron also took issue with unregulated products, as it was called, uh, such as those created by groups such as NSO Group. Uh, you may be familiar with that name because they have products that are used for things like spying on uh, lawyers and, and journalists and stuff like that by somebody that buys access to it. Definitely, you know, to folks who don't have necessarily benign intentions by any stretch and, and are abusing those capabilities. But I do wonder a little bit, what do we mean by unregulated products? Um, there are certainly groups like NSO Group that would be targeted, organizations, right? But she said she wanted to avoid... Uh, marketplaces for vulnerabilities and exploits because they make us less safe, is, as she says it. Uh, so how far would that reach? You know, what type of products are we talking about here? Penetration testing applications? Would that fall in scope of that? What are the regulations there? What would those look like? How do you control that? You know, so it, there's not a lot of information here, but it's it kind of got my attention on, on some of those statements. Um, so I'll just leave it at this with a, a line from the register because they come up with really uh, you know good, good pithy lines, if you will. Regulation, intervention, counter-criminalism, whether you like it or not, it's the way British InfoSec's going to be for the next few years. Um, I would add American InfoSec as well. Check out the show notes if you want, like to read more. Thank you, Jason. Uh, and finally, if you like slapping virtual people around, simulated drug use, and pretty much all sorts of simulated freestyle mayhem a la American Psycho, or say hello to my little friend, kind of, you know, that kind of stuff, well, the OPOG is back. Rockstar Games announced that, the, that all three of the original Grand Theft Auto games would be remastered and re-released on current consoles, I guess in 4K, I don't know. Um, so when the original game was released, it got so much bad press, and there were congressional hearings and so forth with all sorts of hand-wringing, pearl-clutching, you know, end is near, think of the children, uh, all these kids are going to grow up to be psychos and whatever. Uh, I immediately went out and bought it to see what all the fuss was about. Uh, I do that with a lot of stuff. The more you want to ban it, the more I want to look at it. Um, and I mean, I have to admit, I, I wasn't very good at the game because I, I actually felt I felt really bad about like punching homeless people or setting hookers on fire. I mean, I just it didn't really appeal to me. I, I you know, I was like, oh, OK. And it seemed to be kind of a quintessential part of the game. I mean, if it's your thing, I guess I'm glad you're doing it in a game instead of on the street. But it really was, you know, sort of the original source of open world type games. I mean, it was a big deal because this was one of the first games I ever saw where you could just do whatever you wanted. You didn't have to follow like a sort of set piece. You could just go and run your car over a bunch of people or whatever. And of course, this, you know, generated all sorts of outrage. Of course, the original one of these was Death Race 2000 which was a video arcade game where you ran over these little stick people and got points. And, you know, it was just people were outraged and people who played this game would probably turn into, you know, psychopaths. It was unbelievable. And I'm not a fan of censorship. And, I, and usually people who will say this will be the end of our civilization are just people who want to figure out how better to control you. But I will say this was the first game that made me say, wow, that's, that's pretty extreme. Anyway, thanks, Jason. Thanks for joining us today on Security Weekly News Remote. Aaron is going to fill in on Friday while I try to get home. Uh, I will be back in the studio next week. Please get your shots, really, and I'll see you then. Bye.